I would say that I had a pretty happy childhood. My uh, parents had a jewelry store, and um, of course it was already, that is, we are talking about uh, 1921 after the war, and uh, I always thought the war is, was in back, back in history until I got to the point where I was able to recognize. I was maybe three years old and I thought, all of these things, that, and how about all of these people sitting in the streets with cut off limbs, uh, war, war victims? And, um, but I, that, that is, at that point was far back, although it was just three years, as I said, that the war had uh, ended. And uh, I, um, I had a happy childhood because I, I would describe my parents very uh, concerned with my safety and the, the, the kind of things that even at that point, I was maybe three, four years old, I had a, a, a nanny and um, it, was, it was a happy childhood, young childhood. And as I grew older, I became, of course, aware of some things that um, were not so great, where my mother would t t talk to me about things. That, but what you must remember, kind, kind is the German word for child, that you are as good or better than anybody else, and that you should always walk with your nose up in the air, and you don't let anybody who says anything to you bother you because you are just wonderful. And that was uh, her concern f for walking down the street and, and hearing somebody uh, say, dirty Jew girl. You heard that as a child? I heard that. And then, and then when I became a teenager, uh, I, I understood it. Um, but you know, there was also a very wonderful part growing up in Vienna, because at that point that I'm focusing on now, the socialists were in power, and they they brought about Vienna a, a tremendous change for the good. They built homes for the workers. They were very modern, um, and uh, everybody felt very positive. Uh, of the future. Of course, it didn't uh, last forever. But so I, I, I grew up in that uh, environment. And, um, and I do remember, of course, we like to remember the good things rather than the bad things. We want to get rid of the bad things. And uh, the good, one of the good things that I remember is that because of the social democrats, um, everybody, the workers, the shopkeepers, like my parents, uh, had access to the cultural thing that were promoted by the working party in, in Vienna at that time. And uh, I remember my father getting the, the, the tickets for wonderful things. I went, and I, when it was maybe five years old or so, I was taken to the opera, the, the great big opera, the Staatsoper in, in, in Vienna. And, so, and I remember the first uh, opera I saw was La Traviata. And, and the, uh, these are the kind of things that I remember that are definitely something that I treasure, that I now glance back what kind of life I had as a child. Um, of course, this uh, all fell apart when um, the, 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 the workers and uh, the socialists were defeated by the Christian, um, I think they were called socialists. And then, of course, there was the, uh, the, the breakdown of the economy, and I, but one has to has to know about a, a, a culture of of that uh, that kind that I a, a young person uh, was not really um, 
I'm, I'm talking already the breakdown of the economy. When you were 14 years old, the average young worker's child or children were expected to go out and get themselves a apprenticeship. But because of the breakdown of the economy, a lot of businesses and, and uh, other uh, things that, that p the manufacturing came to sort of a, a halt. And uh, the young people, 14 years old, children who were expected to have a job with someone who would teach them a trade, couldn't get these um, positions. And when I think back now, uh, when, I, uh, when I look at these children, they were children, 14 years old. They were not really wanted at home because the father was out of work and, and, and home was a, a dismal place. Uh, one of those uh, old uh, decrepit uh, houses that Vienna was just full of. Uh, my mother used to say to me when we went uh, to the castle Schönbrunn, which Franz Josef lived there, she, and she would, would stand up there on, 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 on that hill and say to me, my child, this is the, and I'm using the German word, Häuser mehr. Häuser is houses, and mehr is ocean. This is the ocean of, of houses, the tenement houses of Vienna. That was something that uh, she must have had. Why was she showing that to you? She was trying to explain to me the city from up that hill, beautiful, facing the Franz Josef castle. And she looked beyond that and saw the miserable housing conditions that the people had. Were your parents social democrats? Yes. Yes. Very strong so democrats. Um, when business got bad, um, my father, I, I remember him saying this. He said, you know, I'm a Democrat, but I think maybe communism wouldn't be so bad. I wouldn't have to worry about how business is and everything belongs to the government. And I wouldn't have to worry about what, what's going to happen. We would be taken care of. That was very interesting when I think back. What was your dad like as a person? He was, he was a very uh, kind person. He never wanted to hurt anybody. To give you an example, and I, f I find myself saying this, I've thought about it, but I've never really explained this to anyone, that uh, he only wanted the people that worked in the store to feel good and uh, never to feel that they are just people who work there and are not being cared for. And I remember when, um, when one of the other, uh, the, the word is learning, parentheses, paren apprentices, apprentices uh, got sick or something, he would send food to, uh, her parents' house and, and things like that. And I now when I think about these uh, kind of uh, this kind of behavior, I I really feel that uh, that he of course was still highly uh, influenced by the the Emperor Franz Josef's reign. He was a benevolent uh, monarch and loved by most people, and particularly also Jewish people. What was the position of Jewish people in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that, in the during Empire? During that time, they felt a false, quote unquote, security. They, they felt good about the emperor, 
Uh, and then when the emperor left, um, they still felt secure because actually he wasn't really gone. Every, everything still was going. To give you an example, the first mayor in, uh, of, of Vienna, uh, if you've ever been in Vienna, there, his, his name was Karl Luege, and he had a great big stat, um, what is it? A, a statue or a palace? A statue. statue. He had a great big statue in a very pr prominent spot in, in the inner city, which was very elegant. And, um, and he was known to be an anti-Semite. And it's, this is the story that I, that I never forget. Someone, and, and he, in his cabinet, he had a very large number of Jews. And this will give you an idea how the Viennese his character was and his humor. So someone, and he, so someone asked him, Herr Mayor, you're known to be a Semite, but how come you have so many Jews in your cabinet? And he said, whoever is a Jew, I determine. You know, it, it was that kind of, I think that was probably typical for uh, Austria, but not the the Austrians outside. You know, that was that was a different world. But in Vienna, that's the way I grew up. What was your mother like? She was a businesswoman. My father was the the charm element of the store, and he, he could sell. He was a wonderful salesman. But uh, my mother ran the business. She bought the merchandise and uh, uh, what she would buy and, and all that kind of thing. She was a very strong woman. And um, I, I remember we, we were on, on vacation outside of Vienna and she went into a monastery. I think it was a monastery. The monastery is for male clergy, but she went into a place where the women were the nuns. And um, she, I remember she rang the bell, she rang the bell and uh, one of the nuns opened the door and my mother said, can I just look around? This is so pretty, it was a, it was a beautiful place. And then after, um, after we left, she said, i never forget that. She said, this, is, this might be a good place to hide a Jewish child. <laughs> when did she say that? I think I was maybe seven, seven years old. I will never forget it. Wow. Yes. Early on. Early on, yes. Did they see it coming, do you think? Did she see it coming? Anti-Semitism was always present. You know, it, it really was. You were probably 12 years old when Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933? Um, no. In Germany. In Germany. In yes. Germany. That, 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 but not in Austria. No. Right. Was yeah. there in 1933 when Hitler came to power in Germany? Did you, did your parents talk about that? Did they discuss in, in it? In Germany. Um, I don't remember that they did. And it may have been simply uh, a case of where they didn't want to know what was going on in Germany. But something did happen. Um, the German Jews were under, uh, under anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism. Under anti-Semitism pressure, pressure in Germany. And um, a lot of the young, a lot of young German men, 
it was mostly young men who fled to Vienna. And um, they were Zionists. They wanted to uh, um, let the Jews in Vienna know what's coming, what already exists in the neighboring country, and they should go to Palestine. And I was maybe uh, 14, 15 years old at that time. And I belonged to a club that was founded by, uh, it, was, it was a club where, where young people came and played ping pong and stuff like that. But also, always the German young Jews, and usually young men, maybe 15, 16, 17, 18, came or, or somehow got away from, from Germany to uh, um, make uh, people aware that they should go to Israel. And at that time, it was Palestine. It was uh, on my birthday. And, um, Which is when? March 11th, 1921. Um, and I remember my very best girlfriend who lived a block away um, and her parents had a very big uh, women's clothing store, uh, one of the new uh, quote-unquote inventions, ready-made, beautiful clothes, rather than to go to a tailor. And, uh, and they did very well for a while. And so this, this friend came over, and uh, on March 11th, uh, uh, 19... 38, and um, said they took her father away. That is when Hitler marched into Vienna, and the Nazis became... Did you see them literally yes. marching? Well, <laughs> I was at home. My parents, I mean, I, we, we did not, we were afraid to go into the city. Um, so, because... In the newspapers, and, and at that point, or still, you could you could find out what was going on. That uh, Hitler was 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 marching into Vienna, and the women, the uh, the Viennese women, were throwing flowers in his path. So we knew that, um, and of course, the the the, the workers' children. The, the kids who were supposed to get jobs at the age of 14 to learn a trade um, were put into those khaki uniforms, the Nazi uniforms. There was a grocery store across the street, and for, for in my growing up years, uh, the grocer and his wife were so nice to me. And... Um, and then, you know, another thing, on May the 1st, the workers or the shopkeepers would put on a red carnation in their lapel and celebrate the workers overnight. When Hitler came, these people who ran those small shops turned into Nazis. Now, why? So how did this grocer treat you after the Anschluss, after Hitler marched in? Was there a change in how they treated you? Oh, yes. Yes. But then they were convinced, well, now the, the economy went kaput. You know what, what kaput means? Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and by then, the Social Democrats became Nazi supporters. They became Nazis. Um, I remember my, my brother, who was five years older, um, there was a, a, a watch uh, maker uh, who worked in our jewelry store. And he, when Hitler marched in, said, if you, he said, 
I can do the, I can repair the watches, but I cannot be in your store anymore. And then my brother was the one who, who went to him to bring him the, 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 the watches and things that needed to be repaired. So my brother went there to, to bring him the stuff because he didn't, he didn't want anymore to sit in a Jewish person's store. Um, and, and he came, my brother came back and said, you won't believe Herr Chandis is a real Nazi. He had a khaki uniform on. And, it, and then, um, then he said, uh, my brother said, I remember that. And he, he told me that it won't be khaki much longer. He's going to be elevated in the party and is going to wear an SS uniform, which is, I think, no, black. So, um, so that, you know, that was, um, the beginning of 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 of, um, of the horror, and then of course you know came Kristallnacht, when uh, the, the the windows of Jewish businesses were blown up and broken. Do you and remember that? that I night? remember that very well. Could you talk about what you remember? All right, I remember then uh, that. Um, we lived not too far from a synagogue and uh, that we belonged to. And uh, the, yeah, I forgot a word. The person who runs the religion in the synagogue. The, the rabbi? rabbi? Yes. The rabbi, um, and the cantor, the cantor is the one, the person who sings according to the Torah. And um, they were put in the, into the syn syn synagogue, which was about two blocks away from where we live. And, um, and the Nazis blew it up. I belonged to a group of people uh, my age, young men and young women, uh, who sort of formed a social group. We went out together, maybe four or five people. And, uh, and I remember after, after the Nazis moved into Vienna, um, there was a, a family outside Vienna. The, I don't know whether you know that there is a, a wine district outside Vienna. It's called Grinzing. And they lived in a garden, t a, a, a charming home with, with a garden. And um, the husband was not Jewish. The wife, the wife was Jewish. So they felt at that point more secure. That, that was just a dream. And we would go there, I mean, my little social group, Young, young women and young men, maybe f six or seven of us, would go to that place with the husband not Jewish and the wife Jewish and felt secure there. And then the Nazis already were in Vienna. And, um, and I remember actually very, uh, very happy times but of course it was just very short. My father was a heavy smoker and there was a tobacco shop across the street and, um, and my father told my, asked my brother to go across the street and get him a pack, pack of cigarettes and they caught him up. Who caught him up? The Nazis. And, uh, just for walking outside? That's right. And, um, and then the next thing that we heard, he, he wrote where he was, and uh, that um, he, wants, uh, us, uh, my, he wants my parents to send a certain amount of money so he would have some money to, to buy things in the uh, not, uh, concentration camp canteen, 
I remember, of course, you know, my mother went to pieces. And um, they, they, they went across, we were friends with the uh, priest in the, in the church across the street. Um, and um, my mother, oh, my father at that point was in the hospital. He had, he had a very serious disease. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to stop on that. But uh, he uh, he had open wounds, and I, I guess I'm going back and forth. I remember one situation when he came home from the hospital. My brother was already in the concentration camp, and um, the Nazis came into uh, to our apartment, um, knocked on the door. Jew in German, of course, Jude, aufmachen, open up, and. Um, and then uh, I, I remember the language that he used. He said, um, I want to speak to the Jew, Oscar Goodman. And my father was lying there uh, with an open wound. And, and, and he had been, as I said, uh, um, uh, told that he had diabetes. And, uh, and, she, and, 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 he, and I was hiding in a wall that we had in our f foyer that, that was look, it, it, it looked like a, a, like a wall where uh, you hang up your clothes at the entrance of, a, of an apartment. And, uh, but it, it had a depth that led to the other room, the, my parents' bedroom. And I, so that was a closet, and I was hiding in that closet. And they came in, and I heard all that conversation uh, with my father in, in his bedroom, where he said, um, get up, you. And I knew he couldn't get up. He was so sick, and, and, and the, the wound was dripping. And I, I broke out of that little closet there and went into the room where they were t attacking my father. And I, I, you know, I never really talked about it. It just, just came up. And I, um, I, I tore open, I took, uh, I rolled back his, his, his uh, c cover from the bed, and I tore open his wound and I said to the Nazi, is this the kind of person that you're going to take to your headquarters? I said, look at him. And, uh, you know, it worked. I was amazed. But they said, you come with us. And I just, I mean, can you imagine my parents? Did you end up going with them, those Nazis? Yes, but at, at that time, I already had my visa to come to America. And I was, you know, I was very arrogant. My, that, that, that kind of arrogance, uh, I think my mother instilled in me in order somehow to protect me. So, um, so, so anyhow, I had my, my visa in my pocket to go to the United States. And then another part of this story is this, why it was that my parents never could get out. Yeah, and we'll, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get, uh, we'll to, get that. to that. All right, so, um, so there I was, and they took me up. Uh, to some garage in Vienna. And uh, now remember, this is when the Nazis already invaded Vienna. And um, so they took me up to the garage and had me clean the cars. And, they, and I remember this one Nazi said to me, well, how does it feel for a Jewish girl to clean cars? you know, to, to do some real work. And I said, I remember that. I said, oh, that doesn't bother me. 
because very soon I'm going to be with my uncle in the United States. And he has two cars. And then I, then I told him a, a little white lie. And he said that I will be able to learn to, to drive, drive, drive one of the cars. And so you're giving me an opportunity to practice. And um, that's how I, uh, how, 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 what my, my mother particularly instilled to me never to be weak in the face of danger like this. So you wanted to know how it was that I got away and my parents did not. There is such a thing as a quarter. And um, a lot of uh, people from Poland uh, particularly Jews, but also non-Jews, had emigrated to the United States. And that quota was filled up if you were born in Poland, and a lot of Jews were, lived in Poland, they said they, wherever they came from. You probably know better than I do. But, um, well, anyway. So, um, my father was from Poland. My mother was, was born in, in Galicia, which was at that time still Austria under Kaiser Franz Josef. And, um, So my father could not get a visa to the United States because when I came down into the garden of the embassy, somebody by the name of Morgenthau, he was uh, one of Roosevelt's... Um, he was the Secretary of the Treasury. Secretary of the Treasury said to, to me, uh, not to me, to us, who was who were hoping to get the the the, the visas for the, you know, for the United States for my whole family? If you are asking, quote unquote, if you are I remember the words. If you are asking to fill out a form, how to go, how to emigrate to um, the United States? If you were born in Vienna. You can fill out the form. But if you were born in Poland, you cannot. And you cannot fill the form out for, for uh, your parents if they were born in Poland. And so I couldn't fill out, fill up, fill out the form to apply for my parents to fill out a form to how to get to the United States. Because that quota... The quota was filled, but you were born in Vienna, so you were able to come in. That's right. So I, so I stood there, not, not being allowed to fill out any forms for my parents. So you knew that you were going to go to the U.S., but your parents were not. Yes. What did you think? I thought... I wasn't going to go any place. I, I, I wanted to stay there. And, um, but the danger was so intense that my parents persuaded me that I would apply to go to uncle, uncle, um, I forgot his name. I'm sorry. Uh, in in my my father's oldest brother in Cleveland, and and so it went. Tell me about leaving. What did your parents say to you? The mood, the general mood was that this was just temporary. 
this cannot prevail forever. Um, they didn't, they really didn't want to believe it. And I think a lot of it, and this I'm not saying with pride, <clears throat> a, little, a lot of it had to do with my parents were in billionaires or millionaires, but they were very comfortable. Um, they had a nice apartment, um, did wonderful things while, while the Social Democrats were ruling. And um, no one really believed that this was going to be a, in that slice of history would be a permanent gruesome thing. Somehow it wasn't going to last. It can't last. But of course it did. Do you remember what they said to you when you left? Or do you not remember those words? Yes, well, I think when I was in the train and there were uh, some other Jewish young people doing the same thing I was, um, I remember there was a, a very nice, young, very tall young man, maybe a year or two older than I am. And uh, my mother said to him, as she was standing on the platform, please watch my girl. So uh, that, that was the beginning of my journey to the United States. I, I was lonely. I, and I remember on the ship, I wrote a letter to my parents and I told them um, that I was lonely. And I said to them, whatever you do, s stay together. Don't let anyone separate you. At least you have each other. And uh, I think from uh, from that experience, I um, I um, I became depressed, and uh, it never really left me because of that separation. And I remember, uh, um, I don't know whether you're interested in that. Uh, I landed in Cleveland with my uncle and. Um, and I, some people became, uh, f f younger people became friends, and um, and one of them said to me, I think she was a social worker herself, um, why don't you go to a psychiatrist? You're so so depressed, and <laughs> and I went to a, a psychiatrist in Cleveland. And, and he turned out to be an, a Viennese Jew who landed in Cleveland. And uh, I told him, you know, what happened and how lonely I feel. And uh, he said, uh, you know, my child, if you wouldn't feel depressed and lonely, you wouldn't be normal. The older I got, the more I, I learned because I, 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 I was digging, digging, what, what happened, what happened? Well, you, you may think this is uh, simplistic, um, but one of the things I feel that happened with the Germans, it was after World War I, but it probably happened all the way back in history. But I started with that, what was it? Well, it, after World War I, the Germans were absolutely, what should I say, treated in a way that um, that had to end in some horrible effect on them. And so, um, if the Germans would have been treated after World War I, like what happened to them after World War II. The world at that time would have been different. You quoted to me once from, I don't know who it was, Heidegger or another philosopher, 
who said something like, after World War I, the German was the Jew of Europe? Yes. Not, uh, oh, the, the, the French uh, philosopher. Sartre? Yeah, Sartre wrote a, a, a book, The Jew and the Nazis. And um, in it, he said, they needed each other. And he, I think he was talking about the scapegoat desire of the human being. Um, when did you find out that they were taken I was, away? Uh, uh, I was living with my uncle. Um, and then when my brother came, you know, my parents, uh, did, I, did I already tell you this, that right after I left on the train, <laughs> My mother went to uh, Berlin, and uh, she scrapped together some money um, from the Jew from the jewelry store, uh, and uh, get, get sold it, and um, and uh, she attained relief release of my brother, um, where he told her in Berlin that the Gestapo that uh, he will be. At that time, you paid a, the Jews paid a ransom. It was a ransom. Those were the good days. Those were the good days. That's yeah. right. So, um, so, so, so my brother then um, was released from the camp with the promise that my mother had to make and sign that he was in. Uh, I don't know two weeks or three weeks or a block of time, he has to leave the country. That was still, you know, that was before the, 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 the gassing and the killing and the torturing and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so my brother came, I came in December and he followed me in April. I, I didn't stop investigating and I had you know and I, I don't know what happened to those papers um, after the war to find out just exactly what happened I was in correspondence with uh, believe it or not a a place in Germany it was a, a, a place where people were go for the cure And um, and there, I found out that my parents. Um, this is the end now. It's the end of them. I think the date was 1941. I remember that. 19. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you were put into a train, and um, the train was going toward Auschwitz. And um, the train stopped in a Polish small place called Itzbika. And when you look up Itzbika on the uh, computer, there is um, The train, um, that, what, what, where the train move? What is tracks. it? Tracks, train tracks. Tracks. There is uh, there are the train tracks, uh, and a, in a small train hut um, with um, a skull and an X, and that was where the had the Jews get out of the train and um, had them build a ditch. They filled the ditch with lime and um, I guess uh, Auschwitz was overloaded. I don't know why. But they killed him in there. 
Is that possible? Yes. Jews who's, who went through all that, like, like me, the, the, the children of Jews, um, were granted by um, the German government. And um, I think at that point, and I have to bring that in, Austria was relieved of the guilt. They were considered as victimized by the Nazis because it, who took it over? So, um, but they, um, I, I do get a, a nun, I have to say that, uh, uh, a s not very small amount, monthly fee from the Austrians for having been, um, of having ha had the, the child, the the child of parents who were tortured to death, and um, it's not. I mean, it's just a, it's a token thing, and you know, I have to see it, and I don't want to s sound noble about this, and I, I'm not, but I I feel that. Uh, when you when you consider what's going on, what has been going on ever since that time, and through and and, and through the things that happen, that um, both countries, the Germans, and we know that with, with Merkel, and and the Austrians too, although I think historically they are written they are, are they are they victims in in that whole business of the war? Do you, do we know that? I, do you know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um. I think the Austrians were relieved and released of the guilt because they were taken over by the Nazis. What was it like for you to go back then later? I can't imagine what it must have been like for you to go back to Vienna and you have went to confront back to that past. No. See, by then I already had figured out something, but maybe in a simplistic form, uh, that um, we created all of this. In, 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 um, you know, and I, I know, I'm speaking to a historian now, and you may think this is very, uh, that, that I put up this, uh, made this theory that if we only would have treated the Germans differently after World War I, that um, Hitler would not have become the monster of Europe. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, I, I think you mentioned to me that Donald Trump's rhetoric reminded you a bit of fascist rhetoric that you remember from the 1930s. And I just wondered if you had anything to say about that. Yes. Um, he, he, he doesn't see the importance. This sounds simple of both parties reaching a point of togetherness for the good of the democracy. A democracy cannot work uh, the way it should, being totally split. And we've, we've had statements uh, John Hines, for instance, and many others like this, and Nelson Rockefeller, because I remember he he wrote a a, a, a very fine um, book on, on 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 education that didn't have really any any political thing, but just the interest of the, the community and bringing people together rather than to 
tearing them apart in the most horrible ways. That's what we have right now. My, my brother was really, after the things that he went through, not only the concentration camps, but you know, being five years older than I, he was already a big shot, quote unquote, in my father's business. And um, he, and then, you know, they tortured the people in, in the concentration camps. They hit him over the head. He just, he, he really, I mean, he tried, he tried to be a jeweler here, but uh, it just didn't work out. That's what he wanted. You How know? did he feel about the Germans? Was he as forgiving as you? I don't know. You know what? He talked very little okay. about this. And he, he, uh, his wife, who was just a very intelligent, uh, deep thinking person, um, told me, don't talk to him about it. It was so horrible. I mean, I, he told me one incident, but uh, what the, I don't really feel like doing this, but uh, I just remember when, uh, because he really didn't want to talk about it. But uh, once somehow, I don't, I don't know how it came about that he loosened up, and he said, they took me out of my cot where in a concentration camp and put me on the floor and hit me with the whips on my head until I was, could, uh, I mean, he fainted. So, um, and he really just was somebody who had, who, in silence about this, it was so horrible. Was there a time when you did hate and overcame it? Or did you always have a kind of deeper understanding of them? You know, either you take the 16 or 17 year old Edith. She was so shocked at the separation. And, um, and so depressed. And you know, somebody said to me, and he was a young German man, man who married, a, I have to say this as a, an aside, who met this uh, Jewish girl from, from Mount Lebanon, and they got married. And he said to me, you know, you will always have survivor's guilt. And that's true. That's part of my personality. Is that true? Yes. Feel guilty about surviving. Yes, something? I, I. When I say, when I leave myself and look at myself. Yeah. Um. That's what is one of my emotional soft spots. I'm. I feel guilty that I survived and that I couldn't do anything more, nothing, horribly nothing, for my parents. Because, if I'm very I'm cruelly honest to myself, I feel, when I look back now as an adult, as, as a very, very decrepit old adult, that I was a selfish, teenager, when I came here, I was only really uh, thinking about me, 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 me. How can I get out of this horrible feeling of loneliness? And you know, when we deal with teenagers in, um, in the school, but, you know, I was a teacher, and, um, and because I taught the upper levels of, of German, um, I, I had students who, uh, who were very, very uh, able and, and talented, 
and lonely. Now, at least at the time when I was teaching, I, I don't know, maybe they, they, they kept, uh, I see them running around with, with the races and everything. Maybe there are fewer lonely kids out there today than when I grew up. But I think the, the, the teenager, in a big sense, uh, stands good chances to be lonely. And we, as, as educators, we, 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 we recognize that. Do you agree? I do agree. Absolutely. Did you have anything else, Kevin? No? Edith, thank you so much. Well, thank you. I hope I did any, something that makes sense to you. I, I, I don't have that, of that much inner self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was wonderful. But I want to thank you for your time, really. It and was, I want to thank you for just being you, you know? It's our pleasure. This is an absolutely fascinating, horrible piece of history that you shared with us. Thank you.